Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Simpson Center's Public Education Series, sponsored by UFA Cooperative Limited and UFA's Rural Communities Foundation. The topic of today's online event is Closing the Loop, the Bioeconomy and Agriculture. My name is Brandi Yanchik, and I'm an independent journalist and documentary filmmaker who is based in Edmonton, Alberta, which is in Treaty 6 territory. I'd like to acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footprints have marked this territory for centuries, such as the Naheyao, Cree, Dene, Anishinaabe, Sotu, Nakoda Iska, Nakoda Sioux, Nisitapi, Blackfoot peoples. I also acknowledge this as the Métis homeland and the home of one of the largest communities of Inuit south of the 60th parallel. Before I introduce today's panelists, a couple of quick housekeeping items. If you're having difficulties hearing the webinar at any time today, or you're experiencing an unreliable internet signal, you can always use the call-in number included in your webinar registration email, or by clicking the arrow next to the microphone icon and pressing switch to phone audio. There is a box labeled Q&A, and this is where you can pose your questions to the panelists. If you see a question in the Q&A box that you think is important to ask, you can also click the thumbs up icon on the question to move it to the front of the queue. We will also have a couple of poll questions for you. Today's event will consist of the presentations by our panelists, followed by some questions after each presentation. We will then have a panel discussion around the topic. Please be aware that this event is being recorded. The recording will be uploaded to YouTube and you will receive the link in an email along with the post event survey. We will be taking clips from the video and posting these on social media. We do hope that today's event promotes more discussion with a broad diversity of participants. Today I am joined by two distinguished speakers for this discussion. Shelley King is Chief Executive Officer at Natural Products Canada. Laura Anthony is the Manager of Public Policy at the Canadian Standards Association Public Policy Centre. Welcome. Before we begin, we have a poll question for the audience. At a global scale, what percentage of Earth's resources are cycled back into the economy at the end of their use? A. 15.2%, B, 8.6%, C, 27.4%. You have one minute to answer the poll after which we will display the results. Okay, it looks like we have those results. 15.2% of the participants think that 15, oh, sorry, let's start again. 31% of the participants think that 15.2% of the Earth's resources are cycled back into the economy and at the end of their use. 69% of the participants think that it is 8.6% and 0% think that 27.4% of resources are cycled back into the economy. Now the answer to the Zoom poll is, only 8.6% of materials extracted from the earth are cycled back into the economy at the end of their use. I will now invite Laura Anthony to start the discussion. As you listen to her presentation, can you please think of some questions that you'd like to ask her and put them in the Q&A box. In your question, please tell us your name and a bit about yourself, such as your location and your profession. Hi, Brandy. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Anthony, and I'm a manager of public policy at the CSA Public Policy Center. The center was established in 2023 to tackle uh, and create solutions to very difficult and complex policy challenges facing Canadian policymakers. We've, to date, we've released uh, six reports. Uh, the last ones were on 
uh, accessibility policy in Canada and the policy implications of remote work. Uh, and we have uh, a number of reports slated for release uh, in December and January. And I encourage you to check them out. I've included our uh, website link on the slide there. Uh, and the reports are kind of catched uh, into these four priority areas, which I've listed on the slide. Today, I'm going to be discussing a report that we released last year, almost a year ago to the date, uh, rounding the corner towards a circular economy in Canada. And this report really provide, provided a high level overview of what circularity is. Uh, and it looked at three case studies in Canada of uh, organizations that are really trying to implement circular practices and look at what is helping them succeed and what obstacles are they facing. And it finally, it concluded with eight key opportunities for policymakers. So my presentation is really gonna be a high level overview of the circular economy and where the bioeconomy fits into that picture. So why do we need a circular economy? Uh, to put it simply, uh, the amount of waste and our demands for materials is unsustainable. Uh, in the next 30 years, the amount of waste that the world produces is slated to grow by 70%. And the amount that we consume is going to require uh, the resources of three Earths. So it's really becoming unsustainable and our levels of consumption um, are no longer able to be uh, contained by, by the resources that we have. Uh, Canada is no, oh, sorry, I'm just going to put this down because the sun has come out for the first time in Toronto today. Um, Canada is repeatedly uh, in the top 10 uh, countries that uh, produce waste per capita. So we're no exception um, to kind of uh, not having a waste problem here uh, within our uh, country. And Particularly, this is bad when it comes to food waste. Nearly 60% of all food in Canada is lost or wasted annually. Uh, and there's a huge economic cost to this. We'll see uh, kind of throughout my presentation today, but there's a lot of value in a circular economy and there's a lot of room for economic growth um, and there's a lot of opportunity. So the circular economy really kind of changes our fundamental modes of production and consumption. So at the top here, I have uh, two, I have uh, an image of the linear economy. So we can see it from left to right. Linear economy is really focused on it taking from the earth, making our products and goods and disposing of them with really little consideration for the value of that waste or what that waste could be used for and very little uh, thought put into how much we're extracting and limits of these finite resources. Uh, in contrast to the linear economy, the circular economy really changes how we produce and consume goods. And it does so by um, reducing our impact on the earth by using renewable or recycled content, changing how we use products by instead of buying new products, we're going to lease them or share them more than we do now. Uh, as well as reducing the amount of waste that we're that we're creating by either making products that last longer by repairing them when they break instead of throwing them out because it's cheaper to buy a new one, or by extracting value when a product is at the end of its life by taking the product and the waste that's associated with that and turning that into a resource and a valuable one at that. At, at present time, despite the many benefits of the circular economy, only 6% of Canada's economy is circular. Uh, so a big part of today's discussion, of course, is the bioeconomy. So when we're talking about the bioeconomy, we're really talking about this issue of circular supply. So in a circular economy, we're, we're moving away from finite resources, in particular fossil fuels, and we're trying to replace these linear inputs with recyclable recyclable goods or renewable goods. And the bioeconomy is really looking to biological materials to fill that void and decouple our economic activity from consumption of fossil fuels. So one of the definitions of the bioeconomy uh, is the use of biological materials, whether that be algae, trees, human waste, um, and using science, technology, and innovation to provide sustainable solutions. And while some uh, examples of the bioeconomy, like 
burning wood for energy has been around for a, a while. Um, new advances in science and technology based with te in modern years has allowed us to really propel that forward. Um, and I think we'll see later today all the amazing things that are generated from the bioeconomy with this new level of technology. And uh, the, the bioeconomy kind of helps fill to kind of help close the close the circular loop. So critics of the bioeconomy, uh, sorry, of the circular economy, a lot of jargon, critics of the circular economy argue that uh, you can't reach full circularity, right? So we're always going to have to extract uh, finite resources from the earth and there always will be waste from what we use. It's impossible to completely close the loop, but the bioeconomy really helps to achieve full circularity by replacing non-renewable inputs fossil fuels, et cetera, with renewable resources, whether that be wood pellets or human waste for energy. Uh, one critical uh, study on the bioeconomy released a couple years ago by the McKinsey Global Institute found that up to 60% of materials and products in the global economy have the potential to be from biological material or are already from biological materials. So again, there's a huge economic opportunity and advantage here um, to adopting these practices. There's three outputs, I guess you could say, from three main outputs from the bioeconomy. The bioeconomy can generate energy, whether that be clean fuels or heat, biomaterials. Uh, so uh, it's used, we're using cellulose to create other bioproducts. These are biomaterials. And then, of course, bioproducts that are manufactured with other biomaterials. And in some uh, leading jurisdictions, they're starting to explore the concept of a circular bioeconomy, not to confuse anyone, um, which really kind of takes the, the benefits and the strengths of both these models um, and helps to achieve full circularity by closing the loop and tackled climate change and sustainability. So back to the report that was released last year, uh, the benefits of the circular economy, there's kind of two main benefits. Um, one, it's improving environmental outcomes. Uh, the circular economy can minimize waste and therefore reduce the greenhouse gases associated with that waste. Uh, estimates suggest that nearly half of global emissions are from how we make products and use them and how food is produced. So there's huge opportunity here on the path to net zero. Uh, and a lot of uh, scholars and uh, thought leaders in this space argue that there is no path to net zero without incorporating uh, more aspects from the circular economy or the bioeconomy. Again, in terms of material extraction and what we're taking from the earth, uh, it can account for 90% of environmental impacts on biodiversity loss and water stress. So there's a huge toll of, uh, unsurprisingly, of the linear economy of just take, take, take with little concern of how much we're using. Uh, the other benefit of the circular economy is creating economic value. Uh, one study from the World Economic Forum uh, estimated that the circular economy can provide up to four and a half trillion dollars in economic benefits by 2030. Uh, and academic literature that's looked at uh, the effects of adopting circular practices from uh, businesses has found that it can increase uh, cost efficiency, improve revenue, and it drives cross uh, sector collaboration. There's also uh, the potential for social benefits when moving away from the linear model to the circular model. Um, one being, of course, if we address the amount of emissions that are generated uh, by our methods of production and consumption, that has a positive impact on reducing pollution and therefore human health will stand to benefit. Uh, the other argument is that by uh, reevaluating the waste in the food system, uh, food insecurity can benefit from that because we're taking value from where there's waste and that can be reintegrated throughout the food system to improve uh, food security. So I don't wanna understate uh, that the, the scale of the transformation to a circular economy is, is quite significant. Um, one, of, one of the reports that I read will uh, compare it to the industrial revolution. So it's a huge shift in, in the way that we buy goods and use our goods. 
Um, but that said, uh, some uh, jurisdictions and some organizations in Canada are already doing this uh, and they're doing it well and they're succeeding. So in the report, I uh, spoke to them just to figure out what is working uh, within Canada. So I looked at three case studies, um, uh, smart cities in Guelph, Ontario, Metal Tech Alley, which was uh, out in BC, and Fashion Takes Action uh, in Ontario as well. And they're all from economic sectors, as you can see there. Uh, and kind of some of the key success factors uh, that they were all involved in. Uh, one of them was just promoting education about what the circular economy is. And they were doing this um, among their stakeholders uh, and among consumers, uh, and also uh, uh, with businesses that stand to directly benefit from what the circular economy can do for their um, operations. So there's still a lot of uh, unawareness of the benefits of the circular economy. The other key kind of component that they were uh, involved in is providing businesses with support to kind of uh, explore circular practices within their value chains. And often this looked like uh, financial support. So Smart Cities Project in Guelph has a lot of um, funding that they provide to small and medium enterprises, uh, like 20 grand to three uh, SMEs to explore how circular practices can improve their value chain. And the other thing that was very common to all of them was they're really on the ground building relationships across sectors and within value chains. Something that doesn't happen too often in uh, a linear economy is the need to, uh, for someone who produces uh, tofu to talk to someone who produces muffins. But in the Guelph example, um, tofu byproducts actually ended up uh, being the waste of it actually be, uh, was turned into value within a muffin manufacturer. So they're really kind of building those relationships. Similarly, a lot of uh, shared obstacles across the three case studies. There's just a lack of awareness of the circular economy. There's also a lack of standardization across the products that we use. Uh, for one example of the in Metal Tech Alley is EV batteries and their charging components. So there's no need for those to be similar. They can all be designed differently based on the producers. And so at the end of the life, the recycling plant uh, that's responsible for taking this, this black mass, they call it, and turning it into value, um, it's very onerous for them to do that. So uh, a lot of challenges to really kind of excel the circularity forward. There was also a lot of inconsistent uh, legislative and regulatory frameworks. Uh, and a lack of adequate infrastructure, as I think we're probably all familiar with um, across Canada when it comes to recycling our products. So I think I'm on time or short for time, so I won't get into the key opportunities for government. I also think that these are gonna come out uh, during our discussions today. I encourage you to check out the report to look at these in more detail. Um, but they were built off of the common success factors and challenges that I found. That's it for me today. Uh, questions, uh, and you can also contact me at my email below. Thank you. Well, that was fantastic, uh, Laura. Thank you very much for sharing your presentation. I'm sure we all learned a lot. My first question for you is, what is the unique opportunity for Canada to participate in the bioeconomy? What is particular about Canada's environment in relation to other countries? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I think that Canada is really uh, well suited to address, to, to tackle a bioeconomy and they're really well, we're really well positioned. Um, per capita, Canada has the most biomass in the world. So this is a huge source of bioenergy is just the amount of forestry that we have. Uh, we also have a significant amount of agricultural land that we can use for the residues and, and biomass in that uh, extent. And we also have a lot of waste and a lot of municipalities are exploring different ways that they can repurpose their waste into biomass. Uh, and that is being done. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in Canada to address this. And as a resource-based economy, uh, Canada's past to the bioeconomy is going to be different from other jurisdictions like uh, Europe and other leading jurisdictions like that. 
Okay, so I have another question for you. How could the government incentivize the circular economy? Could this involve adopting new procurement practices or implementing recycled content mandates? What can't the government do? There's so many options. Uh, uh, the government has so many levers that policymakers have at their disposal uh, to kind of spur the market and incentivize the demand for circular products or biomaterials. Um, uh, governments across Canada, the federal government spends up to $200 billion a year uh, on procurement on goods and services. So there's a huge economic power there uh, for the government to do something as simple as change the way that it procures goods. Uh, the United States has a bio preferred uh, procurement program. Uh, and I have, I couldn't remember this off the top of my head, but uh, I have notes here on what it is. Um, it has a category of 139 bio-based products um, for which the agencies involved, like government agencies and contractors have to have purchasing requirements for. So there are a lot of governments uh, internationally that are already doing this work. There was a study in Quebec that found that uh, circular procurement practices could reduce Quebec's material footprint by 7.9%. Uh, and increase the overall circularity in the province by half a percentage, which seems like not that much, but is uh, quite substantive. Um, there's also a lot that the province, the, uh, the federal government's already doing. We have the clean, clean fuel standards. And just this year, um, they released a recycled uh, mandate for recycled content. So by 2030, half of plastics must be recyclable. And this was really following um, leading jurisdictions of what was already happening. So I'll, okay. I'll leave that there. Excellent. Well, we have a um, another question from somebody named Lindsay Beavers who sent in this question. There is a lot of unawareness about the role of ruminant um, livestock play in the existing circular economy. For example, ruminants eat byproducts like pea screenings, we chafe spent distillers grains, they can also consume damaged crops or non human grade crops. How can we increase the awareness and appreciation of this existing uh, circularity in the livestock sector? Great question. I'm not uh well versed in that specifically i didn't look at that in the report or have done research on that to that to this date um there might be some lessons learned from the case studies of how they're uh, increasing awareness of circularity um a lot of it has to do with education uh whether that be kind of through meetings or conferences uh that kind of thing that's a lot of the ways that the current uh organizations are really trying to promote education Okay, well, thank you so much for that, uh, Laura. We really appreciate it. Right now, we're going to hear from our next guest speaker. There'll be more time for audience questions at the end. I now invite Shelly King to share her presentation. Please remember to type your questions in the Q&A box. When you ask your question, please tell us your name and a bit about yourself, such as your location and your profession. Thank you, Brandy, and thank you, Tara, and the Simpson Center for <clears throat> allowing me to come and talk about the opportunity for Canada's agri-food industry. As Brandy mentioned at the beginning, I am Shelley King. I am the founder and CEO of a national organization called Natural Products Canada. So I'm going to start the presentation today just kind of looking at some of the global challenges that we are facing. And I'll talk about the approach we are taking to those challenges and some of the core pillars of the work that MPC is doing or other Canadian entities. And then I'll get into some concrete uh, examples of how Canada is already seizing the trillion dollar opportunity in bio-based products. Technical difficulties here. So if we look at the global challenges, I think we are all well aware the issues that we are facing uh, across the globe. And then I'll and our food and nutrition challenges I'll talk about later on in the presentation. But beyond those, we have many other global challenges. We have mental, mental health. We're facing an epidemic globally. And here at home, we have about one in five Canadians experience mental illness each year. And of course, we have a host of environmental issues, including 
the health of our fresh water, fresh water and our ocean resources, our degraded soil and natural habitats, a growing plastics crisis, and a rising greenhouse gases leading to a warming climate. Addressing those challenges takes a multifaceted approach of technologies and, and solutions. We at MPC are focused on the biological base side. Uh, that means we don't focus on things like IT or engineering solutions. I'm not saying they're not important, but our in but we focus on innovation that is continue contingent on naturally occurring molecules. And we are specifically focused on solutions that are better for the people, animals, or the planet, and hopefully in some cases, all three. And we're looking for highly innovative solutions that really make a difference and that can be protected in the marketplace by some type of intellectual property. These bio-based solutions can be applied to solve issues across many sectors and industries well beyond the food and agriculture sector. And these solutions come in all shapes and sizes. For example, Jeanette Genesis converts food waste into bioplastics that can biodegrade in our compost bins. Light One is creating sustainable dyes made from microbes. And Entosystem is raising insects as poultry and fish feed, and then using the byproduct as a highly effective soil additive. So the vast potential has now created a trillion do dollar opportunity globally. Consumers, governments, and industry are now seeking these these solutions and it's creating huge market potential. The numbers on this slide are specific to the bio-based or natural solutions within these categories. And this is the market that NPC is helping our clients capture. Like other clusters, we bring five key stakeholder groups together. Most of this will be obvious to some of you, startups, researchers, in investors and large corporations. And it's an ecosystem where all the right types of players work together. Uh, through collaborations and partnerships and coordinated communications. And our hope is, is that uh, people give to the ecosystem and receive something in return to help advance natural products and technologies. We play a central role in providing leadership and strategic support to this ecosystem. We do many things like we offer advisory service to entrepreneurs to make sure that they're on the right commercialization. Uh, path. We have non-dilutive funding up to $250,000 to, to help entrepreneurs and <clears throat> research institutes really uh, get through growth hurdles to make their, their businesses viable. We have an innovation hub where we can connect various stakeholders from across the ecosystem. And we also provide access to uh, funding through our investment fund, Nadera Ventures, which is a private held $50 million investment fund that was a spin-off of Natural Products Canada. We have an extremely lean team across the country and um, that we, we have a national focus, we, we like to say with the regional presence that is really key to our ability to identify issues from across the country and help leverage resources um, and the expertise, expertise to address them. Since 2016, we've connected with over 3,800 stakeholders. We've worked with over, we've support or assessed over 1,500 Canadian natural products and opportunities. We've invested in 13 companies. We've supported over 60 companies through our commercialization program. And for every dollar that we put into Canadian companies, they've been able to go on and raise an additional $64. So working with these many stakeholders has made us aware of the issues facing the agri-food industry, both the big challenge as well as the big opportunity for Canada. So as I alluded to earlier, if we look at these three big challenges in the agri-food industry is really feeding the world, nourishing the world, and protecting the planet while we do so. We're at the point in the next 50 years where we, we have to produce as much food as we have in the last 1,000 years. We need to find more ways to maximize the nutritional value from the food we produce, and we need to figure out how to reduce the environmental impact of our agri-food systems. These are complex problems and complicated systems. We don't have all the answers, but we have incredible potential in the bio-based technology to address some of these challenges. So the potential for bio-based innovation plays a role throughout the entire industry and in everything from how we grow food to how we upcycle waste products. For example, improving 
crops, animal and soil health for increased productivity, finding new diverse products from agri-food industry, addressing trace traceability, food security, food safety, and upcycling waste products from one part of the agri-food agri industry into the value added products that can be used in or outside the food industry. So if we look at some concrete examples, these companies address the big challenge of producing enough food by 20, 2050. They do it by keeping the soils and the ecosystem healthy. BioSun develops fertilizers and biostimulants that can tr contribute to the health of our ecosystem. Lucent creates carbon neutral and non-polluting fertiliz fertilizers that help regenerate soil. And BioTap develops biopesticides to protect apples and other fruit bearing trees. These, these companies also address the big challenge of producing enough food by 2050. They also address the challenge, the issue of food waste by keeping more animals healthy. And this is uh, related, can be related to a question that was asked earlier. Novavine addresses production, uh, animal health, and the issue of antimicrobial resistance. Cambiosin develops for powerful protein sp species specific probiotics to improve the health of production and companion animals. And Healthy Cow has created a natural veterinary health product for dairy cattle. Another area of significance to Canada is alternative proteins, which have seen unprecedented growth in the last five to six years. These three companies come at the alternative protein opportunity from different angles. Sunnydale Foods offers state-of-the-art fractionation and extrusion facilities to increase market opportunities for value-added plant-based products. Grain Frac has a fact fractionate, fractionation technology to cost-effectively extract the protein from oil crops like canola for the plant protein market. Small Foods creates proteins from unique from microalgae that produce wholesome food, food ingredients that are rich in omega-3s and DHA. And they also, they all address the challenge of meeting the food demand for 2050, providing healthy plant-based food, food options and generating fewer greenhouse gases. New crops and new bio-based technologies allow us to address the demand for sustainable textiles and other materials. Um, Inca will apply unique technology to create dur durable, lightweight parts for a broad range of industries, including recreational vehicles. So these companies are really creating sustainable products outside the food industry and are helping farmers grow the rotational crops that help rejuvenate their soils. If we look at uh, using some of the bio-based technologies, we're also to address some key issues of food security, food safety, and traceability and transparency is issues. For example, Fresher Technologies has created an active antibacterial packaging solution that helps keep fish fresh up to 30% longer. So again, these companies are looking at tackling the food waste challenge. When we look at maximizing quality, we have these companies that provide, uh, you know, an example of how a company can address all three big challenges, food supply, nutrition, and addressing greenhouse gases, as well as other environmental health concerns. Prairie Fava is a, a Manitoba-based company that saw a market opportunity for fava beans that were free of glycophosphates. This led to a collaboration with farmers to grow some unique varieties and par partnerships with uh, consumer packaged good companies to develop soy-free to tofu catering to the demand, growing demand for plant protein. If we look at the companies that are addressing the challenge of nutrition and reducing GHGs, we have an example from Crush Di Dynamics that converts winemaking derivatives into healthy food ingredients that enhance flavor and allowing food formulations, for, few formulate, form, formulators, sorry, to reduce both sugar and salt. Uh, these companies are addressing uh, the GHG re uh, reduction, each of these diverse waste stream into resources and reduces the amount of petroleum based products in the supply chain outside the food. So if we look at Zila, for example, is using compounds in hemp to create <clears throat> bioresins. 
And that is the end of my presentation. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Wow, Shelly, that was fascinating. So many companies and interesting things that are happening and so many opportunities. Thank you for that fascinating presentation. Um, my question for you, please, Shelly, is do we need more biomanufacturing facilities in Canada? What is the impact of not providing these facilities? I think the short answer, Brandy, is yes, we do. I think where the challenge lies is having a strategy, whether that may be Canadian, regional, or provincial, to actually know what are the right facilities that we need. And then, of course, if we don't have the facilities, and we've seen this um, happening in, in some of our industries where Canadian companies are going globally to get the, the infrastructure that they need to get further along the commercialization pipeline. Okay, I have another question for you here, Shelley. What are the biggest challenges faced by new companies that want to create bioproducts? For example, where is financing needed most? <laughs> Everywhere. Uh, <laughs> that's the short answer. Um, really, we whether it's for bioproducts-based companies or other early stage companies, you really need to have the financing from the kind of the proof of concept, the thought uh, area all the way up to your series A, B, and C. So we try to fill a gap at the very early stage, um, stage, sorry, my, my phone just went crazy, at the very early stages of a company. So we do it through both non-dilutive and with our new venture fund, Nadera, also through <clears throat> a, a venture capital approach. Okay, so I have another question, which I'm going to ask you, um, for uh it's going to be for Shelly and then Laura if you want to uh jump in after and turn your camera on that would be great so Shelly from your perspective what is the right balance between regulation and innovation in encouraging the circular economy and this was from the chat and the person called themselves anonymous or it's just anonymous yeah I, I think I keep myself anonymous in asking that question for you know it depends really um what side of the fence you are. Entrepreneurs sometimes get frustrated at there may be the cor correct regulatory process is not in place or the process is in place and it it's, it's, can be kind of arduous. But if we look at it from the benefit from Canada, Canada is known for high quality regulations which ensures the health and safety of our products for people and animals and planet. So I think there has to be a balance where it doesn't hold up innovation, but at the same time, we have to be cognizant that there should be regular, should be some level of regulations around these, these products. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to thank both of you today for your uh, participation. Uh, Laura, do you want to add anything to that last question um, that came in from Anonymous? Uh, I, I agree with Shelley. It's it's a big question, and it's it's beyond just the circular economy, right? The the dynamic between regulation and innovation is sustains across the policy uh, field altogether. So it's it's a big. It's I agree with Shelley. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much for weighing in on that uh, question from the audience that we have a quick poll question for everyone. And the question is, after hearing today's discussions, what do you believe was the estimated value of Canada's bioproduct sales in 2015? A, 875 million, B, 2.1 billion, C, 4.3 billion. You have one minute to answer the poll, after which we will display the results.
Okay, so 40% of the participants said they believe the estimated value of Canada's bioproduct sales was $875 million in 2015. 47% of the participants said $2.1 billion, and 13% responded with $4.3 billion. And the answer is... Bioproduct sales were estimated to be 4.3 billion in 2015. Domestic sales accounted for 2.9 billion, 66.8%, and exports accounting for 1.4 billion, 33.2%. Thank you for doing the poll with us. That's always a, a fun experience. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to our panel discussion. Thank you both for the excellent presentations. We have a few questions prepared for the panel discussion. And if there's time at the end, we'll take another couple of questions from the audience as well. So please put those questions in the chat and upvote the ones that you'd like to see our panelists address and tell us a little bit about yourself if you're putting questions into the chat. So the first one is for Laura. My first question is for you. How can we improve measurement of the circular economy? What are the data challenges that we need to address in order to forecast, improve, and support the circular economy in Canada? Uh, thanks for the question, Brandy. I appreciate it. I'm excited, looking forward to the panel discussion. Um, we can improve measurement by measuring, uh, to put it simply. Uh, there's not a lot of measuring that's going on uh, right now, especially when you compare um, the quality of data that we have in Canada with the quality of data, uh, data elsewhere. Um, you know, the, the Q&A question that we just had, what was the sales from 2015? Um, that does seem to be the most recent data that we have for the value of the bioeconomy. Um, but in addition to kind of the economic impact of the circular economy, um, there's a, a, the big need for consistent uh, data on waste and material flows. Uh, and this is something that seems to be really important uh, for actors in the circular economy is just figuring out where our waste is going and where is it coming from. And we can't even answer um, something that simple across all the economic sectors. Uh, I'll give an example of Finland, which is really kind of leading, uh, one of the leading jurisdictions on this. They measure domestic material consumption, circular material use rate, net sales, the number of companies in circular sectors, and the number of sustainable and innovative public procurements, just to name a few. Um, Canada has a long way to go to prove uh, its measurement of circularity. And Shelley, do you want to add anything here about how we can improve measurement of the circular economy? I think Laura hit it on the head, measuring it. Okay, so Shelley, this question is now for you. What are the biggest challenges faced by new companies that want to create bioproducts? What critical infrastructure is needed in Canada to support a bioeconomy? Sorry, Brian, is that for me or for Laura? Oh, I'm sorry, Shelley, it was for you. So what are the biggest challenges faced by new companies that want to create bioproducts? What critical infrastructure is needed in Canada to support a bioeconomy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really that the same challenges across the board when you're starting an, a, an early stage business, you've got, you've got money, you've got intellectual you got to have money to do your intellectual property you need talent and you need good science and then you know we talk about infrastructure uh, we touch on that earlier yes we need places for companies to scale um, that's always a challenge and then also access to talented hr whether it's through increasing our training in canada or being able to recruit globally Okay. And Laura, do you want to add anything about the biggest challenges faced by new companies that want to create bioproducts? Not really. Okay. No problem. I can't hear you because your microphone is off. Sorry. I was, my mouse was on the other screen. I was trying to find a mute. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, okay. um, I don't know the bioeconomy as well as Shelly does. So, uh, but I will say in the, the circular economy, other side of it um it's it's the same like funding <laughs> funding and resources uh is a huge issue on the circular side 
Okay, so Laura, this question is for you. You listed eight key opportunities for government to help transition us towards the circular economy. How much progress have we made in developing circular strategies at the federal, provincial, and local levels? Do you see this shift being adopted more readily in any particular layer of government? Thanks, Brandy. Yeah, one of the recommendations was for federal, provincial, and municipal governments to develop circular strategies or roadmaps. And these kind of differ from what we see in Canada today because they're kind of concrete, actual plans of this is what we want circular to be, and this and kind of give concrete goals, uh, which are able to measure. Canada is a, is a long ways away from that. We don't have national circular strategy. We don't have a national bioeconomy strategy. We have pieces of it. Uh, we have the ban on single-use plastics. We have the clean fuel standards uh, federally, provincially. Um, you know, a lot of uh, provinces are focused on extender responsibility when it comes to recycling. Um, and municipalities, of course, are dealing with waste. Uh, but federally or provincially, there's no, uh, uh, sorry, except for Quebec. Uh, Quebec is queer, uh, a clear leader when it comes to kind of uh, addressing circularity and coming up with a roadmap. Uh, but we're kind of lacking federally. I would say uh, on the whole, Canada is probably like five to 10 years uh, behind uh, leading Europe uh, juris jurisdictions. No one is is 100% circular, right? So even in the best uh, examples of circularity, they're still mostly linear economies. Um, we're really, you know, I think what I found uh, one like, was 25% circularity is like the most circularity that anyone's ever reached. So everyone's, you know, it's still a new thing. Everyone's figuring it out. But um, to build that kind of strategy would be a bit more meaningful to the market and to incentivize demand, I think, than kind of the incremental steps uh, that we've been taking. Um, aside from Quebec, which is a clear leader, leader provincially, there are several municipalities that have uh, taken it upon themselves to develop circular strategies and circular roadmaps. Um, Squamish in British Columbia, as well as York Region, Ontario, uh, have developed uh, circular roadmaps. So um, municipalities don't need to wait uh, for the federal or provincial governments to do this. And, and given um, you know, the, the federation and how we've uh, distilled power throughout, they still do have a lot of autonomy to develop these strategies and, and implement them um, in the ways that they're able to do. Uh, so I would say every level has a role to play um, and they can do it together, but they can also start doing it individually uh, until that happens. Okay. I'm actually from York region and oh. I remember composting in grade two. So uh, that they were definitely a leader. Shelly, do you have anything that you would like to comment on regarding this last question? Um, just briefly, like I do agree that you can have provincial regional strategies, but I'm a big proponent of having a national strategy. You know, as Laura talked about earlier, we have lots of biomass across the country which is a big component of being able to have a bioeconomy or a circular economy, but it's not all the same across all jurisdictions. So really we had a, a roll up on a national strategy, then that would help us better identify the manufacturing capabilities needed and where, and really what sectors we as a country should focus on where we can have a leadership position. So Shelley, just staying on the same question, is there anything new that you're seeing or any shifts towards new circular strategies? Um, circular strategies are really more in Laura's Laura's camp, but in terms of the bioeconomy, I mean, there's talk at the federal level for a bioproduct slash bioeconomy strategy. We've been talking to various levels of government on a fermentation strategy for Canada, which contributes to bio economy, bio product development. So the discussions are, are ongoing. Um, I would like to see some kind of strategy in place sooner rather than later, but you know, it's not just up to natural products, Canada. Okay. Laura, anything else you want to add on this uh, conversation here before we move to the next question? No, I think, I, I think that's it. Okay, perfect. So Shelly, this question is for you. What is the market demand for bioproducts in Canada? Do you see that changing? 
Well, as I said or you know earlier in the deck, it's a one trillion dollar opportunity we have here, and I don't see it. I actually see it increasing because again, if we talk about global demand, including in Canada, is being driven by many factors, including consumer demand for cleaner and greener, more transparent supply chain, government regulations and policies that kind of in incentivize green technologies and environmentally friendly solutions. And, you know, while we're in this global warming and climate change continues, it's going to heighten demand across the globe. Okay, now this question is for both of our panelists, so please feel free to jump in. I'll ask Laura first. Is there a need to increase awareness and education about the circular economy? Do you have suggestions about how we can approach this and who should be responsible? Yes, I do think that there is a need to increase awareness. I come from a policy background, so think tanks, and I was working at a provincial legislature before my role now, and there was not a lot of talk of the circularity or the, what the circular economy is in kind of traditional policy fields. So uh, the translation to the policy world and policymakers, it's still very much in its infancy, as well as with consumers and businesses um, kind of on the ground. Uh, I, and that was that was true um, with the three case studies that I looked at. All of them said uh, improving education and improving awareness is one of the main kind of mandates that they're focused on as the first step to achieving circularity is just telling people what it is and why it's important. Um, in terms of who's responsible for it, I mean, everyone to a certain extent, you know, th these are really um, big collective and shared problems that we're facing uh, with climate change, sustainability. Um, so I don't know if it's it's fair to say it's, it's one organizations or one levels of government's responsibility. In Finland, um, they do incorporate uh, learnings about what the circular economy is in curriculum, like really in um, school age children's uh, programming. I don't, I, I'm not as familiar with programming in Canada, but I don't know if it's as advanced as what we have in Finland. Uh, and uh, in terms of the case studies that I looked at in my report, uh, several of them are, were also involved in training. So some of them were holding workshops for youth. Um, you know, Metal Tech Alley holds workshops for youth about STEM and, and, and advanced manufacturing and kind of what the role is uh, for, for their future in circularity. Uh, the same was true um, in smart cities in Guelph. They have the circular accelerator program where they're really doing a huge education component um, uh, with SMEs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one way probably in the next couple of years uh, is continuously funding these economic organizers that are already doing it and fund them better. Um, but I think there's roles for uh, traditional educational pathways as well. So Shelly, what are your thoughts based on your experience working with companies in this space? Yeah, I look at it from a slightly different lens. And as I said earlier, you know, financing across the whole spectrum uh, of company growth is important. And I think Consumers are well aware of the value of the bioeconomy, circular economy, where we try, what we try to do at NPC is help raise the awareness of the opportunity to both private and public sector funders in this so that we can, we can make sure that they understand the value of what some of these companies are doing and trying to help them make sure they get access to the right resources, including financial that they need. So we do have um, a question from the chat from Chloe Duchok. And uh, Chloe is asking, um, the government of Alberta is advancing the province's global leadership in the circular economy by committing $58 million through emissions reduction Alberta to projects across the province worth $528 million. Do you have anything you want to say about these efforts? This is uh, mainly for Laura. Sorry, I was just trying, I was reading the question, looking at the finding me on mute. Um, I uh, didn't know about this. I'm not as well versed in um, this, so I can't speak on this specifically. Um, but there are other examples of this, of um, federal 
initiatives uh, that are funding as well as provincial initiatives where provincial funding is being funneled through um, uh, initiatives or programs. I would say that these are great steps forward, um, but they're still uh, a, a fall a little short of a national roadmap or a national strategy. And I'm just looking at the link that the person uh, that Chloe oh. put up. And um, if you click it, it this is a circular economy. Um, uh, that's what the title of the publication is. Looks at the work done by agriculture and forestry's bio-industrial opportunity sector to support a circular economy in Alberta's agri-food processes industry, where the efficient use of resources is maximized and waste is reduced, recycled, and reused for additional purposes. So if people are interested in looking into that, they can click on the link. So Chloe, um, who asked that question, has also written in, uh, the investment aligns with provincial initiatives including the proposed extended producer responsibility approach, the agricultural plastics recycling initiative, and the natural gas vision and strategies goal to establish Alberta as a center of excellence for plastic diversion and recycling. Anybody want to talk about that or is that just a comment? Okay. So um, the link is in the chat if people are interested um, uh, in looking at it. And um, I'm just going to see what the next question is here. Shelly, in your opinion, is there a skills gap when companies with bioproducts try to recruit staff? What do those gaps look like? Um, I, I would say, yes, there's, there's, a, there's a skills gap. Uh, we have seen it um, a little bit at the, the higher level, like the senior management level. We do have a non-dilutive program that allows companies to hire experienced individuals um, to advance commercialization efforts. At the you know kind of junior level or the three to five years, it seems that we have you know a, a supply of talented work workforce. But as the company grows, scaling and bringing in some ex experienced individuals, there's a little bit of a challenge around that. And Laura, do you want to mention anything when it comes to the skill gap and companies um, are looking to re recruit st uh, staff? No, I'm not as well versed uh, in that area. Okay, so um, I want to thank, uh, oh, one more question for Laura, sorry, sneaking in before we wrap up. Laura, how can we reduce economic incentives that maintain a linear economy? Uh, it, uh, bluntly, as I could, uh, you know, fossil fuel subsidies distort the market, right? Uh, recycled plastics and biomaterials and bioplastics are going to have a hard time competing when we're subsidizing uh, fossil fuel plastics. Uh, I'll, I'll end it there because I know we're at time. <laughs> okay, Shelly, do you want to add anything there? I'm good, thanks. Well, thank you to Shelly and Laura for sharing your knowledge uh, with us today. To our participants, you will receive a post-event survey and a registration link for the next online panel discussion about the bioeconomy and agriculture. Please also go to the simpsoncenter.ca website and subscribe to hear more about upcoming events and receive our monthly newsletter for information based on research about Canadian food production. Thank you very much for joining us today.